I have to admit that when IBG announced the release of these essentially prototype Panzer IIs, I wasn't really planning on one to be in my build queue anytime soon. I love the Panzer II and the Panzer I for that matter, but there was something about the running gear on these early Panzer IIs that reminded me of an adult trying to wear children's shoes. Something just didn't feel right with that transitional design. But as the modelling gods often do, they had other ideas for me and I found myself with the kit in hand and some strange compulsion to build this shiny new thing. As with pretty much every model I have in the build queue, I start the research process and more often than not end up falling in love with the subject. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? The more we learn about something, the more we can appreciate it and immerse ourselves in the build. The kit looks quite nice in the box, but sometimes the build doesn't translate, so with high hopes, I began the build. G'day guys, I'm Clayton and this is Workbench Hobbies. Construction began with the wheel sections and care was required to remove the drive sockets from the sprues because the gates were attached to the teeth. It would be very easy to accidentally remove the detail in that part. The wheel sections are removed from the sprues and lightly sanded just to remove any lumps and bumps. The plastic is very soft and was very easy to sand flat spots to the wheels so caution is required at this stage. Each wheel includes three disc sections per piece and the connection points were shallow and care was required to ensure that they all sat correctly before applying the glue. The assembly shows some distinctive lines where the parts are sandwiched together but interestingly the wheels on the actual tank display a similar look. I know IBG are planning on releasing a set of resin wheels for this range of kits and I think it's probably worth consideration at this stage. The return rollers and bogey arms were clipped off the sprues so there was only one connection point remaining. This would allow me to pre-paint these sections before attaching it to the model. The paintwork won't really be the final finish at this stage and in reality the sections will all be weathered on the finished model. So this could be regarded as an exercise in efficiency as it will speed up the painting process having this area undercoated at this stage. The wheels and the arms for the bogies are now painted with the aid of a spraying template. They are first painted in a rubber black colour and then once dry the template is used to lay down the German grey in the centre of the wheel. The crossbeam supports for the road wheels are supplied as photo etch pieces. They are easily bent into shape with the aid of a bending tool and I suspect they would have been as easily bent using a pair of flat nose pliers. The hull section comes as a moulded piece with the front and rear plate attached at this stage. The location of these parts was a little clumsy and it didn't have a defined seating position. It's pretty obvious when the parts all align, it's just not that definite. The housings for the idle wheels and spacer are fitted to the hull section at this point and the detail in the moulding was reasonable however there were some significant gaps at the connection points. I tried not to obsess over these areas because most will be out of sight on the finished model. There is also a great deal of movement in the part which will affect the position of the idler itself and ultimately the tension on the tracks. I aligned it as best I could looking at the instructions, but it's just so unclear. Well, my instructions unclear. The tow bracket is installed at the rear of the tank, as well as a small clear part for the rear light. I removed the light fitting later because under certain light I could see it wasn't sitting straight. And again, it came down to the way the pieces were engineered in this kit and the undefined way that they should be fitting to each other. There was also a call out for four wing nuts. 
pieces, part W5 in the instructions to be fitted at this step. However, there were only two supplied with the kit. I did, however, find more wing nuts on a completely different sprue. And it's just another little oversight in this kit and something to keep an eye out for when you build it for yourself. The fittings for the drive sockets are attached to the inside of the transmission covers. However, the part number noted in the instructions is incorrect. Rather than U3, they are found on sprue H and part number eight. The transmission covers are attached in place. However, again, I've had to shave down some of the part to ensure it actually fit in place. You may also notice the imperfect fit of the frontal armor. I'm hoping once the model is assembled and painted, some of these indiscretions will be hard to detect. It's just back to that unrefined fit and assembly. The hull section received a quick undercoat of German gray as an insurance policy before attaching the wheels. This area will receive the bulk of the weathering effect so paintwork didn't need to be perfect. The bogies were assembled and the sub-assemblies were attached to the hull with long pins that run through the crossbeam. Unfortunately, the way the pins sat in the holes was less than perfect and some modification was required to allow them to fit. The whole stage was really awkward and quite unstable and because I was needing some movement in those bogies it was important to ensure no glue was migrating through into those sections and that was far easier said than done. The best way I found to assemble these parts was to super glue the three pins into the face of the etch crossbeam. The location holes on the hull were drilled out a little further to ensure a suitable fit. The bogey assemblies were then fed over the pins and the whole section was glued in place ensuring the wheels were aligned and even. The main body of the tank is supplied in two sections, the bulk of the casemate and rails in one piece and the engine deck as the other. And whilst the front half found its position on the chassis reasonably well, there was no real defined position for the back half of the track guards and rails and there was some guesswork as to how high or low they should sit. The piece for the engine deck was fitted and was again a little clunky and required some coercion. I could see a problem unfolding however with the hatches on the left hand side of the engine deck. They were dry fitted however I could see there wasn't going to be enough space for the armour plate to sit in behind them. Everything had to be sanded and forced into place. But if you look closely, you can see the hatches are blocked by the vision hatch on the rear of the fighting compartment. Something to be mindful of when building this for yourself. The side walls for the rear mud flaps were attached, but again, I was having challenges with placement and fit. Everything just felt like guesswork and some plastic surgery was required to get them to sit flush with the mud flaps. And then to the issue that I was aware of prior to starting this build, the weld seams around the casemate needed desperate attention. The way the model is made is by attaching the thin armored sections around the casemate. And unfortunately though, the weld seams are on the edge of that piece and not on the edge of the corners. Plus there are no welds at all on any of the vertical joints. With the way the kit is made, you not only have the weld issues, but worst of all, you see big gaps where the parts are connected and will require filling. I'm sure some modelers can overlook it and I wish I was one of those who could, but I can't. And so I set about trying to improve it. The gaps were first filled with the Tamiya filler putty and sanded. The downside of having to do this, apart from the obvious, was the fact I lost the detail and positions for the lift hooks. This would need to be addressed with aftermarket pieces.
To re-establish the weld seams, the beveled edges were first softened with Tamiya Extra Thin and whilst soft, an impression was left in the part using the edge of a hobby chisel. My efforts were far from perfect, but it was better than it was and again, I was hopeful that the effect would tie together under a coat of paint. The vertical weld seams were created by first gluing a small piece of stretched sprue along the join and then, as I did previously, softening the part with the extra thin cement and leaving the impression in the plastic with the edge of a hobby chisel. Drilling the two vision holes at the driver position is also a quick and easy way to enhance the detail on the model. I painted the top section of the casemate with Mr. Surfacer Primer to give me a better look at how the process had shaped up. And whilst it looks a little rough under the microscope, it was adequate to the naked eye. I noticed at this stage that the hatch covers from the engine deck just magically appear on the instruction sheet and don't actually get a part call out. And whilst they are easy to identify, that's not the point. It's really not good enough for a modern day kit. That's not good enough. And once in place, there seems to be an incredibly oversized gap around the edges. Now I have no reference to suggest that that is incorrect. It just looks wrong to my eye. Construction now moves to the turret and the hardware for the hatches were pre-assembled. The detail is very good and from my understanding they are supposed to be poseable and movable but the way the parts attach to each other I can't see how it's possible to not get glue in the moving section of that part. Two of the assemblies included have a section of armoured glass and the others did not. The auto cannon and machine gun sections are assembled and are given a massive helping hand with the aid of a set of brass barrels. The difference the aftermarket makes to these parts really can't be understated and should be considered for anyone thinking about building this kit. There is very little interior detail in the kit, but what there was was quickly painted and prepared for assembly. The gun sections were painted in German grey and dry brushed with a gun metal paint and chipped with steel coloured acrylic on a sponge. Given the lack of meaningful interior, I suspect I will close the hatches on the finished model so I didn't spend too much time on the painting. Gun assembly is supposed to be movable, but again, the way the kit is engineered means it's just about impossible to have movement in that part due to the way that the glue migrates around the joints. The gun assemblies are attached to the mantlet using generous amounts of super glue. Now the super glue will work better with the painted parts and hopefully give me a nice strong bond in this section. The mantlet is attached to the underside of the turret and then the top side is glued in place. The fit was okay but would require some filling once dry. As mentioned earlier, the detail for the lift hooks was lost in the sanding process and I've managed to source a replacement set of 3D printed hooks from Heavy Hobby and set about replacing them around the model. They were a little smaller than the hooks in the kit so who got the scale right I'm not sure but what that meant is I needed to replace all of the lift hooks around the model rather than just the ones that I damaged in the sanding process. The refinement of these 3D printed parts was welcomed however and they did look great in place. The brackets for the mud flaps are supplied as two pieces of etch and are attached to the edges of the plastic parts. I'm not really sure that the etch in this area was something that couldn't have been just represented in plastic just as well. However, they are stuck in place and again, we will reserve judgment until the paint is in place. The various tools and stowage boxes were added to the right hand side of the track guards and whilst there were obvious positions for most of the tools, the framework on the side of the tank had nothing to indicate where it should go. So again, there was some degree of guesswork required and I'm still not sure it's in the correct position. 
or even what its purpose was. I assume it may have been some sort of external machine gun mount, but I'd love to hear from someone who could confirm that, so leave your comments below. The front lights and horn are set in place as well as the spare wheel. The spare wheel has to be placed using references again and I know I'm sounding like a broken record but there is no set position for placement of this part. Just too much guesswork for my liking. I'll also note here that the brackets for the tow cable, which isn't included in the kit I might add, are also noted incorrectly in the instructions. It should be sprue K, not J. And it's frustrating to say the least. This is so frustrating. And at the risk of boring you, the bracket across the front of the tank is glued in place, but yep, you guessed it. It's extremely difficult to identify the placement of that part so I fudged it as best I could. The exhaust section is assembled and glued in place and the kit comes with an etched screen, which is a lovely touch. It's first annealed using a naked flame and you wanna get the etched part to the point where it starts to turn red and change color. And what the annealing will do is soften the etched part and make it easier to manipulate and roll around. Once annealed, the part is rolled around the handle of a paintbrush to give it its shape. And as for the positioning of this grill, again, there is some guesswork required as there is no obvious positions for the brackets to sit. Super glue was used to attach the etch part to the styrene of the model. This version of the tank had the fitting that housed the smoke candles attached to the rear of the exhaust and each smoke candle has a small piece of chain that would be used to engage them in battle. Now the kit comes with the chains as etch, however I chose to substitute the etch for fine chain that I had in the stash. The chain is overscale, I know that, however I felt it was a better option than trying to use the two dimensional etch. The chain was incredibly awkward to attach and work with because it just wanted to flop around and the access was tricky, so I really struggled to film this process. I do, however, think it was worth it in the end and the chains really added that extra level of detail to the model. IBG do have plans to release this part as a 3D print, so if the renders are anything to go by, I'd say this would be a welcomed addition to this build. Finally, the left-hand side of the tank and the jack has some lovely detail. However, the mounting bracket and how they attach is again quite clumsy and requires a certain amount of guesswork. The cradle for the aerial is supplied in two halves and they are glued in place. There is significant warping in this part, so I attempted to carefully correct it. The aerial itself has four significant attachment points from the sprue and it would be really tricky to clean that so a piece of stretch sprue was a quick and easy fix for that issue. And time to place the aerial mount and of course there is no defined locating hole for placement. Obviously it's not that difficult to work it out but I just shouldn't have to. Then back to the turret and the various hatches around the turret were glued in place and it's a shame there isn't any more of an interior in the kit because the commander's hatch is big enough to show a great deal of detail in that open position. Prior to the kit arriving I purchased a set of 3D printed quick tracks for this model. I did that partly because I didn't trust the tracks that might be in this kit and secondly I was looking for an excuse to try 3D printed tracks. I've made a full video on these tracks so be sure to check out the link so I won't cover old ground here. But to my surprise the kit supplied tracks were outstanding and possibly even a little better than the aftermarket set. The downside is there is a lot more time required in the cleanup and the assembly of the kit tracks whereas the aftermarket tracks built up a lot quicker.
I'd pre-assembled the 3D tracks, so I'll use them on this build, but it's worth noting the tracks in the kit are extremely good. The tracks were painted as a bit of an experiment and attached to the model, and they are only loosely fit at this point to allow for removal during the painting process if necessary. Interestingly, the instructions call out for 109 links per side, however, this seemed way too tight for my liking, and I ended up adding an additional 4 links per side, although I may revise this at a later date once I start gluing them in place. One of the things I've always found a little intimidating with my models is adding stowage around them. Granted, there is a plethora of aftermarket sets dedicated to specific subjects, but the generic nature of these can sometimes look too structured and derived. I found that using bits and pieces from the spares box and seating them on a tarp sculpted in two-part putty looks a little more natural and plausible. Two equal sized pieces of the putty are twisted together until they become a unified colour. A hard surface is then coated in talcum powder and a small ball of the putty is rolled out using a pencil. Ensuring there is a generous amount of the powder will help avoid the putty sticking to the board and the pencil. Once the putty has a uniform thickness and a suitable surface area, the shape is cut down into a rectangular section. Excess talc is removed using water and then the tarp is draped in place over the model. By carefully planning the placement of the stowage and seating it into the soft putty, I'm able to create an interesting and realistic look to the model. I've got plans to add to this, however the stowage is fitted at this point and is now ready for paint. The pressure on my air compressor was turned up and the airbrush was used to blow off any plastic shavings or surface dust. Some modelers wash their builds prior to the painting phase, however, I find this technique is usually adequate to prepare my model for paint. Black basing isn't something I usually do, but given these early war panzers were painted in dark grey, or panzer grey, I figured the black base would be a good starting point and help me keep the depth in the finish. I didn't bother masking the tracks and running gear, as the Mr. Surface of 1500 was decanted and sprayed through my airbrush, so it was easy enough to control the application. And with the primer down, I think that's a good place to wrap this episode. Now, I had no intention of this being a kit review, but now I'm at the tail of the build phase, it seems appropriate to share my thoughts on the kit. The cons, the kit suffers from errors through the instruction sheet, and Whilst it's not a killer blow, these are details that just shouldn't make it into print in a modern day release and it adds to frustration. There's also a lack of detail around positioning of the parts and this was an issue throughout the whole build and me having to check against references constantly became a little bit of a chore. And finally the weld seams around that casemate needed drastic attention. So, to the pros, there's no denying that the Panzer II Alf B is an interesting part of the lineage of German armour and it's a welcome subject for most World War II armour modellers. The workable tracks are also beautiful, although I didn't actually use them. I can't say I enjoyed the build, but interestingly now I'm at the painting stage, I'm finding my love for the subject and the model is growing, and the sins of the construction issues seem to be washing away. I'll be looking to paint and weather this one in the next build episode in a couple of weeks, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, I'll be looking to bring you other interesting content based around this great hobby of ours. Connect with me on Facebook and please leave your comments below. I'll endeavour to answer any questions you might have. Thank you again for allowing me on your screens. If I've added some value, please hit the like and subscribe button. And remember, this is the greatest hobby in the world and we are all in this together. Share it with your friends and connect with your community. It's so important. See you again soon. Serenity now! Serenity now! <laughs>